Hello and welcome to this video. I'm Marcus Hayes, back for another update on my life with my old banger Ford Escorts. Today's video is going to be mainly focused on my ST170 powered Mark 1, which by the time this video has been edited and uploaded, you wouldn't have seen on the channel for two weeks or more. Since then, I haven't been able to make any considerable parts purchases because I've had loads of bills to pay, but it has given me an opportunity to tackle some of the smaller jobs, which I'm going to go through in a minute. First, I want to talk about Maud, my Maudor Mark II, which gave me yet more grief with a clutch recently. This time, the clutch pedal went straight to the floor and I assumed that the cable had snapped. As it turned out, the cable was fine, but it had come unhooked from the clutch fork, which I thought was pretty impossible once the clutch cable is under tension and the clutch is adjusted. I refitted the cable to the clutch fork and it was fine until I replaced the clutch cable the other day. What I've noticed now though, is I'm getting a really bad vibration from the clutch pedal itself. Now these pedal boxes have a lot of nylon bushes in them, which are available to buy, and I think you can get poly versions of them as well. So at some point I need to strip the pedal box apart and replace all those bushes, and then that should take care of the vibrating. Maud also picked up a puncher on one of her front tires. She was due a fresh set of tires anyway. I was running some budget tires on some drift steelies on the back and one of those was actually filled with tire weld, as you'll know if you've been following my videos, and the front Yokies were getting a bit low, and obviously one of them then got punctured, which was actually unrepairable because it was in the sidewall. So I bought a fresh set of tires, and this time I've gone for some Nankang NS2s, which are the same price as the Yokohama A539s that I've been running for years, but these are more of a semi-slick tire and they grip a lot better, even in the wet, surprisingly. So yeah, really happy with them. And now Maud is running the banded steels all round again. And it's worth noting that these Nankangs are available in three different compounds. I've gone for the hardest compound, which is like the street compound. So they should last a bit longer than if I was to use the mediums or the softs. But as I say, they still grip a lot better than the Yokies that I was using before. I'm still yet to receive a replacement sump for Maud from Neil Dunn. And it's getting to the point where if he doesn't send it to me soon, I'm just going to go with a different company. I can't wait forever. Luckily, I've been focusing on the Mark 1 lately, so it hasn't been such a big deal. But South Sitting have now found another venue for the event that they used to run called The Rise. So pretty soon, I'm going to want to get Maud back out drifting. So I really do need to sort that oil leak out. Right, so on to my Mark 1 Escort now. And I'm going to start with a couple of things that I forgot to mention last time. So last time you saw this car, I forgot to mention that I have now received my plug for my Gen V TPS. The first one actually got lost in the post and as soon as I emailed EFI Parts, they sent one straight out to me via special delivery and it came the very next day. So yeah, thanks to EFI Parts for that. I'll leave a link to their website in the description if anyone out there wants to get one of them plugs for their TPSs. Another thing I forgot to mention last time is I've decided on a name for the Mark 1 and I'll now be calling her Esther, or Esther the ST Mark 1 Escort, which I think's got quite a good ring to it. I'm always receiving loads of decent advice from you guys that follow the channel, which I really appreciate. I hardly ever mention it on my videos because I can't remember people's names, but I do read every comment and I take everything on board. So thanks a lot. One guy that got in contact recently is Sparkplug Steve, who made me aware of something called Trigger Offset. After a bit of research, I realized that on a ZTEC, this needs to be set to either 75 or 255, depending on which way round the coils are wired. Now, as you'll remember if you've been watching my videos, I had to switch round the coil settings so that coil A was firing coil B and coil B was firing coil A. Well, my trigger offset was set to 255. So what I've done now, based on what Sparkplug Steve told me, is I've set it to 75 instead and then I switched back my coil settings so that coil A is firing coil A and coil B is firing coil B. And the engine still runs as it did. So the result is the same, but it's a much more proper way of setting up the ECU. Massive thanks to Sparkplug Steve for the advice. I really appreciate it. Sparkplug Steve has his own channel, which I'll leave a link to in the description of this video. It's a pucker channel. He regularly takes his ST Fiesta on track and he used to have an ST170 Mark 1 Focus track car as well. So it's well worth checking out. So make sure you go over there and give him a sub as well. Right, so you'll notice that I now have the radiator refitted to the car, which I sent off to Zach, who runs Zoo Speed. And he has now welded on 
a 90 degree outlet, which means my retro Ford hoses mate up to the rad perfectly. And there's a nice distance between the hose and the crank pulley. Zach also carried out a modification to the back box. The exhaust system's now fitted, but I'll show you the new tailpipe. The back box is hanging a bit low, it's only trial fitted, but I'm sure the anoraks are gonna go nuts with my three inch outwardly rolled tailpipe. But I think it looks really cool. And just to give you an idea of the size difference, it's not a radical change in my opinion, but it looks a lot better. As I mentioned in a previous video, the threads poking through here that basically hold the base for my tank in were a little bit long and they would have ended up fouling on the back box once I've actually got this back box lifted up to the height that I want it. So this one I just turned round because that's a nut and bolt. So I've put the nut on the inside and this one is actually the strap that attaches the tank to the base. Um, and basically I've just cut the stud off so it's flush with this nut. I do have some half nuts if I wanted to gain a few more millimetres, but someone got in touch in the comments and said that I may end up needing to put a bit of rubber between the strap and the tank. So if I do have to do that, then I'll put the half nut on and then it will be flush with that. So I didn't want to cut too much off of it now and then find that when I do put the rubber in between the strap and the tank, that the thread isn't coming all the way through the nut. But with the gap that's there now, and once I've finished adjusting the front of the exhaust system, I'll be able to bring this towel pipe up to close this gap a little bit. This box is hanging on the piss a little bit at the moment because the mount that's over the axle, I've only got a cable tie on one of them at the moment, and the rubber on the other one isn't ideal. But once that's mounted properly, the whole system will twist this way and then it should be sitting a lot straighter. Now the engine's not running great. It's on a base map, which I've actually had to adjust just to get it to idle, and I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, also, I'm not really sure how this microphone on this camera will pick it up, but I'll try and give you an idea of how it sounds. Yeah, it doesn't seem to want to rev properly at full throttle at the moment, but I'm just glad I've got it idling. So at least if I do have to trailer it to the tuners, at least the car's actually running and then they can just go from there. So massive thanks to Zach for carrying out those modifications to those bits. I really appreciate it. If any of you are in the Hillenden area and you need any fabrication work doing, I highly recommend you get Zach to do it for you. The only thing you've got to bear in mind is that he is very high in demand and as such, the waiting time and the price may reflect this. I'll leave a link to his Instagram in the description of this video so that you can contact him. Another thing I've done since the last time you saw this car, which I did mention in a previous video, is I've fitted these stainless steel engine mount cups, which now mean that the engine is back up at the height that it was before, but because I have these spacers in between the cross member and the chassis, I now have a nice gap between the steering rack and the sump. And it's worth noting that my mate George that cut those spacers for the cross member for me actually supplied them in three different sizes. At the moment I've got the 8mm ones fitted but he also gave me some 10mm and some 6mm ones. As it turns out the gap in between the rack and the sump is just right. I don't want to fit any thinner ones because then it'd be too close and I don't need to fit the thicker ones. So thanks again to George for supplying those spacers. Another thing I mentioned before was the battery that was fitted to this was knackered. So I've replaced it with this one, which still fits in the Mark 1 battery tray. It's a round terminal one instead of a square, and the terminals are here, whereas the other ones were there. So I wanted to do a little bit of tidying up with the battery wires anyway, so it wasn't such a big deal. And this one's got a lot more power than the old one, and it turns the engine over no problem. Now, instead of buying the adapters that you can get, where the square terminal bolts to the round terminal, I've actually decided to convert these permanently with these crimp type ones. And I've crimped both of the wires into there, so there is literally just one connection to the battery for the positive. And I've done the same here with the negative as well. One of these wires goes to the block down there, and the other one attaches to the body here. But they're both crimped into this one connector. Now with the radiator refitted, it gave me an opportunity to fully plumb the engine in and actually put water in it. 
Now this water rail that I'm using came with this engine and I don't know who made it. It's very similar in design to the retro Ford one, so I don't know if it's one of their old ones, I'm not sure. I was having a problem before with deciding what thermostat to use. And the thermostat I've used is just a generic one that you'd fit to like a Pinto powered or a Crossflow powered Ford. And I was unsure before about which way round the thermostat goes. Now I actually thought it went the opposite way round to what it should. And that's because I was basing it off of the way that Neil Dunn puts his thermostats in the water rail that I've got fitted to the Mark II. So yeah, the thermostat needed to be the opposite way round. The spring should be in the water. Now I've had to make up a gasket and I'm using an O-ring inside here as well uh, to try and seal it. But the threads in here are M5 and the bolts need to be like two inches long. Now I went to tool station and the only ones I could get were these screwdriver head ones which you obviously can't do up as tight as you would be able to with an Allen key or a hex. So when I tried to run the engine with water in it, water did leak out of that joint. I've ordered some bolts from eBay. Now they're Allen key bolts, but the same thread and length as these. So I should be able to do them up a lot tighter and it should seal. We'll just have to wait and see. And that's why you may have noticed that this Jubilee clip down here isn't done up tight because I needed to drain the water back out once I realized that it was leaking from there. Another thing I'd done the other day was fitted this aftermarket windscreen washer pump. Now I got this from Car Builder Solutions and I'll leave a link to their website in the description of this video. I've just bolted it to the bulkhead and I've plumbed it in, but I haven't actually wired it up yet. And the plug it uses is the same plug that I needed to use for my Nippon Denso alternator. And these are also available from Car Builder Solutions. Now you'll notice that I've got an earth strap here that's going to the body in the same place as one of the screws that's holding on the windscreen washer pump. Now you'll remember that I was going to mount that to the hole in the bulkhead that's behind the engine. But I decided not to because if in the future I need to clean up that earth point or anything it's going to be a right nightmare. So I decided to mount it here anyway. And because it's sharing a hole that the washer pump is mounted to it means I didn't have to drill an extra hole anyway. And then that earth strap basically attaches to one of the starter motor bolts down there. Another thing I've noticed that this dipstick bracket is leaning on this coolant hose, which over time may end up wearing a hole. So I'm probably gonna just grind a little arch in that bracket just so that it clears, because I'm quite happy with where it's sitting. So I don't wanna bend it about or cut it off and have to re-weld it on, I'll just shave some off it and that should be sweet. John and his dolly just come back from the Uxbridge Auto Show I think, which I've missed this year. Another thing I've tried to address since last time is the front suspension ride height. Now the back of this car has got two inch decambered single leaf springs and one inch lowering blocks giving a three inch drop overall. And the front does have three inch lowering springs fitted to the 2.8 Capri front legs. But because I've got alloy top mounts fitted, these tend to raise the front suspension by about an inch. So what I've done as a temporary measure is I took the springs off of the struts and cut one and a half coils out of them. It's still sitting a little bit too high at the front, but I do eventually plan to get some adjustable coilovers for the front. So I'll be able to bring it down a little bit more. The front of a Mark I will always look a little bit higher than the back because the front arch comes up higher on the wing compared to the back, which if we have a look at Maud, isn't such an issue on the Mark IIs. The front arch isn't so high up on the wing on a Mark II. See, I know it's not really advisable to be cutting coils out of your springs, but as I say, it is only a temporary measure and I did only remove one and a half coils. Another little job I did in the boot is this tank filler. Wasn't actually attached to the lip there. So basically I drilled a couple of holes and just used a couple of rivets. To be honest, I should have used slightly smaller rivets because they're poking out the back quite a lot so 
I'm probably going to have to drill them out and use some thinner rivets. But it's attached, it'll do for now. And although the rubber doesn't actually go around those rivets properly because they're too thick, the boot still shuts, so. So I think that's pretty much all I've got done since the last time you saw the car. As I say, nothing major has happened, but it is that little bit closer to being back on the road. The main parts that I still need to buy for the car are a set of rear shocks, some trumpets for the throttle bodies, some harnesses for the bucket seats, and a fan for the radiator. So it's getting pretty close now. Massive thanks again to Zach for doing those bits for me, really appreciate it. And thanks again to Sparkplug Steve for giving me the advice. Thanks as always to everyone's continued support of my channel. I really appreciate it. The last video on the Mark 1 actually made 10K views in a week, which is just amazing. I really appreciate all the support. So if you thought this video was any good, give it a thumbs up. If you thought it was shit, give it a thumbs down. Click subscribe and activate the notification bell to be kept right up to date with any other videos that I post in the future. Make sure you check out my Facebook and my Instagram, and I'll leave the links you need for that in the description as well. Until next time, Thanks for watching.